All right. Now that's a, a little bit of the dynamics of competition. Now, again, I've said this, I, I think, a number of times. You hopefully now have read my blog. I'm not a, a an absolute proponent of, of competition as the only way to look at your strategy. And I think that the book, Blue Ocean Strategy, does a nice job of laying out an alternative approach um, to evaluating strategy. And as I said in my blog, you're not required to read Blue Ocean Strategy. You are required to navigate both my blog and the links that I've provided in the blog because those links really provide you with, I think, enough of the working tools from the book that you can understand the concepts and, um, and apply them not only in this course but in, in business going forward. That said, if you find this topic to be interesting, I would encourage you to read the book. I think the book is it's pretty easy to read. It's about 180 pages, so it's not a... It's not a drastically difficult book to read, um, and I think the framework it outlines is is worth understanding. And it's really one of those books you probably ought to have on your bookshelf or in your um, your e-reader if you're going to um, uh, spend any amount of time or work on strategy issues. According to the according to the book Blue Ocean Strategy, um, it's always important to swim successfully in the red oceans by outcompeting rivals. So. Let's start here. When we talk about blue ocean strategies as a counterpoint to competition, it doesn't mean you do blue ocean and you just ignore competition. Although, to the extent that you're successful in blue ocean strategies, competition becomes less and less relevant. But fundamentally, as a practice, you need to be um, well versed in both. You need to understand the competitive dynamics and competitive rivalry, which I just talked about. Um, but you begin to think about ways to avoid um, being fully bloodied by the competitive rivalry and the competitive dynamics that we just talked about. The red ocean arguments in our textbook are still critical to your understanding of the strategic management process. So um, I'm not suggesting by any, on any level that you forget any of Porter's Five Forces or that you ignore any of the materials in the book pertaining to competitive dynamics. Uh, all I'm saying is that you should conti continue to consider those issues and then overlay what we've learned about blue ocean strategy. But um, if you only think about red ocean strategies and you spend no time considering ways to be innovative and ways of focusing on strategies that will allow you to create new markets and avoid market rivalries, um, you cannot sustain high performance over the long run. So in, it is, I think, important, particularly as I've said in the, I think, the very first lecture, the ch ch rapid change within just about any business segment today requires you to think about innovation. And to the extent that you understand the need to be innovative, you need to understand how blue ocean strategy tools work. And the focus that you apply in Blue Ocean Strategy, as I said in my blog, is value innovation. Value without innovation tends to focus on value creation on an incremental scale, something that improves value but is not sufficient to make you stand out in the marketplace. So, um, you know, building a product that's cheap but has no innovative capabilities is not going to set you apart. Price or value alone isn't going to get you where you need to be. Likewise, innovation without value tends to be technology-driven, market pioneering, or futuristic, often shooting beyond what buyers are ready to accept and pay for. Um, in some of my previous lectures, I've talked about products that were over-engineered, or I've used the uh, analogy to, of engineering to in, in manufacturing segment, sector to my business, which is the financial sector, and talked about uh, actuaries and product design that's actuarially driven as opposed to market driven. Putting every bell and whistle into a product without considering um, the underlying value of the product and whether the customer is willing to pay for those bells and whistles can be a very, very dangerous prospect. So Blue Ocean Strategy really emphasizes through a set of tools and capabilities that are outlined in the book and um, are outlined in the website for Blue Ocean Strategy and the links that I've provided you, um, really outlines how you can uh, get the balance between value and innovation that you need to be considering both. This is the theme that I emphasized last week in my lecture, uh, but it is absolutely essential if you want to avoid 
the competitive rivalries that I've just talked about that you understand how to, to build this balance. And to do that, you need to understand the six principles of Blue Ocean Strategy. They are uh, that you need to reconstruct market boundaries, that you're not bound by where you are today in terms of the markets in which you compete. There are ways to rethink them. You need to focus on the big picture, not just numbers. So to the extent that you're worried about incremental growth or incremental uh, financial results, you can sometimes miss where the market's going. And if you miss where the market's going, your, mark, your numbers someday will, will fall behind uh, your competitors. You need to re reach beyond existing demand. Um, customer demand today may not be where it will be in a year. You need to understand where the customer might be in a year and begin to help the customer figure out that their demand ought to be greater than it is today for some service, some product, some feature, some capability. And then you need to get the strategic sequences right. And again, the book, Blue Ocean Strategy, talks a little bit about the sequencing. Uh, but you need to understand sequencing of uh, that it, this is not just, you know, sort of throw it up in the air and hope that you've got the right mix of value and innovation, that you've thought correctly about where the market boundaries are and that you understand the big picture and you've, you understand where demand might be. There are a set of uh, processes that you need to, be, need to put in place, which, again, the book and the web links that I've, I've provided you provide you some direction in that regard. And then, quite frankly, to do this well, uh, because companies, and I, I will vouch for this fact, I'm part of one of a, an organization that has a 160-year history. We were founded in 1851. We tend to be very much a red ocean company. We're competing against other financial services providers. We don't necessarily see the world in terms of inventing new um, market boundaries or rethinking the products that we offer today in a way that might appeal to a demand that we can't fully predict will, what it will be in the future. So we need to think within our organizations about how our organizations can respond. And we need to understand that organizations will have hurdles. People will say, no, it can't be done. There will be a lack of resources appropriately um, allocated to meet specific needs that, to build out uh, blue oceans. Uh, so you need to understand and overcome those hurdles that exist in your organization. And then you need to build execution into your strategy. So understanding the problems in your organization and understanding uh, where your strategy might go because of demand and expanded market uh, boundaries has nothing, it doesn't ultimately get you where you need to go unless you think about um, execution. And that's very consistent with the book, with our book, with the textbook, and with the uh, strategic management process because this is these are putting the capabilities in place as part of strategy implementation. Execution and implementation are synonymous and you ought to be thinking that way um, as you build out uh, your own um, strategic plans. The first four of these really are uh, about formulation. So if you think about uh, the first four bullets, think in terms of uh, how they fit into the formulation strategy formulation, the six purple boxes in uh, the strategic management process. And then the last two are all about strategy implementation or execution, which is really the green boxes in the um, strategic management process. Now, the, the writers of um, Blue Ocean Strategy acknowledge, acknowledge that blue oceans are largely uncharted. That means that um, the dominant focus of the past 20 five years has been on competition-based red ocean strategies. Um, and there's really have there has been a lack of analytical frameworks to create blue oceans and to manage effectively the risk that we will deal with as we build these blue oceans. So as you think about how you're going to implement blue ocean, understand it's not easy. And to some degree, the book does provide a framework, uh, an analytical framework you can use uh, but because these waters are uncharted, you will get pushback if you're in companies and you're saying, why can't we go over here and do this? And it's something that they've never done before. You're going to have those, those organizational hurdles. You're going to have those challenges. But the book does provide some, some framework for you to be able to, 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 to achieve uh, a blue ocean strategy. And as I said, it offers a whole set of tools that you can use, 
which I'm going to go over very briefly right now. Here are the 12 analytical tools, frameworks, and methodologies that are outlined in the book. I'm not going to go through this list, but there are 12 of them. Um, and over to the right here, as you can see, is the screenshot of the, um, of the tools in the Blue Ocean Strategy um, website. I, in my blog last week, provided a link to this website. You should really go here and understand these. I would expect that you will use these 12 uh, analytical tools, frameworks, and methodologies as you uh, evaluate particularly your team projects. Um, I would be disappointed in a team project that didn't try to incorporate both the six principles and the 12 tools uh, at least uh, as um, an alternative frame of reference uh, in looking at your whatever your strategic question is within your case analysis. Uh, clearly, you would want to have the competitive analysis and Porter's Five Forces, but consider these 12 tools and the six principles as being the equivalent of Porter's Five Forces uh, for uh, Blue Ocean Strategy. All right, let's um, just think a little bit more about uh, what we saw in some of the materials I shared with you. Uh, there was the Harvard Business Review article, the May 10, 2010 Blue Ocean versus Five Forces article. Uh, which I did provide a link. Um, that involved a Dutch retail study. They, the authors evaluated profits and numbers from vendors for 41 shop types over a 19-year period from 1982 to 2000. And they basically concluded empirically that Blue Ocean Strategy is sustainable. So one thing, even though Blue Ocean Strategy is new, they were in a market with the Dutch retail market that um, they were able to evaluate firms that were both applying traditional competitive five forces approaches to their business and blue ocean approaches and were able to determine that there, that blue ocean strategy is a sustainable business model. They did say, however, that it would be foolish to dismiss competitive strategy altogether. This is consistent with the, what the authors of blue ocean strategy have said. Competition eventually erodes profits from innovation. Uh, but it's a slow place, can require 15 years or more. So innovation can get you out and get you as much as a 15-year advantage, but you still need to understand the no notion of competition so you can respond appropriately as your uh, profits gradually erode over time. Ideally, what you'd be doing is constantly Im implementing new blue ocean strategies so that you're out ahead of the competition same time, you should be understanding competition and, and managing your competitive rivalries in a way that you're maintaining as much of existing market share that you've created through a blue ocean strategy so that you're sort of cycling through. And as your profits erode over time, you're, you're moving into new markets, but you're being as aggressive as possible in your defense of existing markets. All this indicates is that businesses may want to consider a blend of the two approaches. That's it. That's, that's it. And that's really going to be a theme for the course as a whole. Think about it that way. One isn't better than the other. They're just two pieces of a whole in terms of the way you approach strategy. And I think that companies that have traditionally been red ocean strategy only have failed to understand that as markets move more quickly, which they are doing and they will continue to do, they will not be able to retain a meaningful market share over the long run. And market share, even the definition of markets, will will gradually become smaller and smaller. So if I'm successful, even if I dominate an existing market today, I can't be sure that that market will even be relevant in two or three or four years if a blue ocean company is able to develop an entirely new market and my customers just leave this market and move over to their market. So I need to be cognizant of the fact that I need to be able to implement both. I need to understand how to um, implement value innovation in a way that I can get into new spaces without having to fight the bloody war of red oceans. But I also need to understand how to maintain my own market share in my existing markets. Uh, so I need to understand those red oceans as I proceed to blue oceans. 